Greetings. Hello, Alafia. What it is, Shawty? I'm from Atlanta, so you know I keep the country. My name is Tajik Anwar Baou. Um, most of you know me as Taj Anwar or Loretta Scott King. And um, I'm from Atlanta, as I said, and I have been organizing pretty much my whole life. That is too long to say in this one session. But uh, for the most part, I've been a member of the FTP movement since 2006. Uh, me and Brother Kalanji have been friends for pretty much that length of time. And I get into what that means in terms of being friends with people that you build with and organize with. Uh, I started an organization called Mothers of Black and Brown Babies, which evolved into Realistically Holistic, which later evolved into Real Whole. Um, I have an independent birthing center in Atlanta uh, that I independently own, operate, and finance independent of the state. And we'll also talk about, you know, funding your movements as well and not waiting on resources from the government to get things started because sometimes you don't need that. And let's see, what else? I went to Morris Brown, went to Georgia State, and ultimately received my PhD in sociology, which is the study of social behavior and organizing from um, University of Phoenix. So yeah, that's me, I'm Beretta Scott King. Thank you for having me. What's up, how y'all feel out there? Clap your hands if you African. Any Africans in the house? Uh, y'all got to be confused. I mean, some of y'all looking like we're in church. <laughs> a church that my people go to, they be shouting and jumping up and down the whole time. You know what I mean? So, some of y'all act like y'all in white people church. <laughs> Same white people church today. You know what I'm saying? We're in Africa. Um, my name is Kalanji Changa. Um, uh, what do I do? I'm an organizer, right? I've uh, been organizing for about three decades plus. Um, I am a father, a grandfather, you know, a son, a nephew, a comrade, a friend, and I'm a, a ancestor's wildest dream, right? Um, I represent the FTP movement, that's the organization I started back in 2004. Um, we're going on 20 years next year. Um, I'm also a co-founder of a platform called Black Power Media. Anybody familiar with Black Power Media out there? Yeah. Okay. Some of y'all need to get familiar. Blackpowermedia.org, find that. Um, shout out to my sister Jackie, who's in the building as well, Black Power Media. Um, yeah, I, I organize, and I'm, I'm happy to be here. Salute to Deron for um, inviting us and being consistent. 20 years, give it up for this brother right here, and for his whole family for putting this thing together. That's a beautiful thing. Anyway, I'm going to pass the mic when we get busy from there. Peace and blessings, everybody. My name is El Angelo Lee, but most people know me as Honeysuckle Moon. I am a plant-based skin therapist and wellness product manufacturer, and I have a personal interest in black people, indigenous people, African people, brown people, in-between people, not being stressed out, all right? Who's experienced stress in the past week? Raise your hand. Who's experienced stress in the past month, year, decade, hundred years, few minutes ago, four hundred years ago? Maybe an hour ago. Maybe an hour ago. The way that we have been taught to deal with one another, the way that we've been taught how to deal with the system that we've been forced to be a part of, it's no longer sustainable. It never has been. And so there's a method, there's a philosophy that we can tap into that goes directly into our ancestral connections. It's those who came before us, who worked, who did everything that was required so that way we wouldn't have to feel the pressure, yet we feel the pressure, right? So my goal is to do the necessary works whether that be in activating self-care experiences, inviting you into spa experiences with myself, and also organizing the Natural Wellness Festival in Atlanta. And so we have a connecting point, all three of us here on this panel. We've known each other for some time. It's been tried and true. 
And, you know, in the spirit of organizing, I would like to say that everybody up here, everyone up here, has always shown up, has always done the work, consistently doing the work, and, you know, and I just want to just take another moment to big up Brother Duran, Brother Manifest, y'all, please give him some love because 20 years of organizing special events, getting everybody to come through, fight through the pressures, fight through the stress, fight through any financial constraints, all of that takes serious faith, serious discipline. So I just want to like really tip my crown to each one of you in saying that I'm in gratitude to be able to hold space and have this conversation. Word. Yo, thank you. Um, so, you know, I was riffing just a few seconds ago, you know, I get on my soapbox. Um, I mean, sometimes I get frustrated, but at the same time, I understand, you know, that we're in a different era. You know, for folks that have been organizing that like over the age of like 38, 40, you know what I'm saying? Like, there was no social media to like, uh, stroke egos, you know what I'm saying, in this work. So it's a different, so like, when I, when I was, when I was, when I first got started doing this work, nobody was, I had to find my people. You know what I'm saying? There wasn't a place for me to go and like there be like, oh yeah, now I got people following me. You know what I'm saying? There wasn't a place I can go and then like, okay, people are like adding me as a friend because they want to see what we got going on. There's a difference between like that space and like this space. Um, so, I mean, I'm curious for, for, for you all, like as folks that have, have been organizing, you know, in the 90s, in the early 2000s, you know what I mean? Or even like the late 80s, you know, like it coming up and being in the, in the generational space, having OGs that didn't have any of this as well. Like, how has your, like how has this in, inflected upon your experience being, you know, seen on the socials, right? And, and, and knowing that you're not doing this work for you know, virality, you know what I'm saying? Or like to monetize your content and shit like that. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I know that those are things for people like, yo, I gotta get my likes up and stuff like that. Like, what is that, how is that impacted or how is that inflected upon you being in the, in, in the work today? Well, I know for us at FTP Movement, um, we were doing the non-glorious work when it wasn't accessible to be seen, right? So most of our greatest work isn't even documented uh, on pictures or film. And, and some of the pictures we got are, you know, by the, the cameras that hold the film, you know what I'm saying? Not even with a digital camera. So some of our, our older documentation is so fuzzy and blurry really the only thing we have is our memory in terms of doing it. Um, some of our most sacred work, like having a personal relationship with uh, Dr. Matulu Shakur Ibaye, you know, so much of that wasn't seen. Like, how, how do you present that on social media? I don't, I don't even know if you can. You know what I'm saying? I don't even know if you can communicate the magnitude of importance that relationships with uh, folks like Leonard Peltier, Yogi Pinnell, Ibaye, you know, Sundiata Koli, just so many, you know. Um, most of that work is not glorious. The times we were up at night, up under the bridge, it wasn't sexy, it wasn't cute. You know what I'm saying? We were, we were down there looking wild and crazy ourselves because we were younger and we were more... We were more renegade than... Let me see you. We were more renegade than um, we are now. You know, we kind of choose our movements wisely and um, a little bit more smarter. A little bit more smarter with how we are moving because, you know, we don't want to make ourselves a target. Um, and for us, a lot of times, putting that 
documentation out there, you know, we had to do that calculating. We had to be really careful because we like, yo, we bringing attention to ourselves and we started to have problems. When we tried to get with a lot of the, the social media movement, we started to have some issues. Um, you know, the, the them folks was out there waiting for us, you know, to cause a problem. Um, there's a couple of pictures of uh, Kalanji going back and forth with um, the Atlanta ambassadors, you know, that are online. And we just have to be really, really diligent about the communication that we put out there about what we're doing because we don't want the focus to be on us. We want the focus to be on the work. So being that we're older also, you know, we're not really fazed by social media because the way you got your clout back in the day was doing the work. Mm -hmm. So social media hasn't really phased us. It has grown, um, uh, made us more out there. You know, people are knowledgeable about what we're doing and what we have going on. But if there was no social media and the internet crash today, we'd still be out there. So that's the only thing that social media in my mind has done for us and you know it has connected us with other like-minded people around you know around the globe and that's dope but in terms of the work being done in our city it doesn't matter if there's a camera out there it doesn't matter if it's two people out there if it's just me and kalanji out there you know we're gonna be out there so social media does not solidify or validate what you're doing One, two, one, two. Good. Mic check. Go. Yeah, um, man, I'm sitting here and I'm listening to what my sister's talking check, about. Y'all hear me good? We good? Y'all hear me out there? I'm listening to uh, what my sister's talking about. And I look out in the audience and it reminds me of home, right? Um, I'm from a place called Bridgeport, Connecticut. And uh, I grew up in the projects, right? Uh, in a project called Paquanic Apartments. And right now it's a parking lot uh, at a uh, arena, right? So when you talk about gentrification and all that, you know, we see little white folks running around where people we know OD'd, where people we know were shot down, so on and so forth. Um, I'm reminded of that because I'm looking in the audience right now and I see directly in front of me my brother Jamal, who I, I grew up with, literally from the sandbox. We did a whole lot of dirt together, not just in the sandbox. You know what I'm saying? But his father, uh, Craig Kelly, was one of my mentors. His father was a veteran Panther, right? So he was, uh, he, and, and Jamal and I was just talking before we got this, before I came up here. And one of the things that we talked about was how we grew up in a, in a, in a community, right? Right now, when you talk about the quote unquote conscious community, it's like a fallacy. You know what I mean? It's just a whole bunch of people clicked up, you know, empty rhetoric, fashionable militancy, a few dope slogans and whatnot, a t-shirt, and, and, and that's it. You don't know where your people live. You know what I'm saying? You don't know how they're doing. You don't necessarily care how they're doing. You understand what I'm saying? But where I come from, we grew up, pissy project, hallways, dope needles, blood splatters, Somebody shitted on the elevator, part of my language, you might have got stuck on the elevator. You know, it's concrete jungle for real. But from organizing over three decades, it was the most community that I've ever experienced. I lived in communal houses. I got some real close comrades around the world. You know what I'm saying? A lot of folks I'm out here, I see out here, I've been knowing for 20, 30, 50 years. You know what I mean? But that particular project was the time when I had the most community because we never missed a meal. We never, there was no evictions. You understand what I'm saying? Nobody got their lights turned off. Nobody dissed you because you ain't have something. It was all love. And we might have fought. We did what they do in the projects. But along came 1985, crack cocaine and the game change. So then folks are selling drugs to people, mamas and all that type of stuff. Fast forward, we talking about social media, right? We talking about community organizing. Keeping it a hundred, I'm not a popular guy in these community circles, right? <laughs> because I don't really care about what you think if you're not putting in work for our people. If you're just trying to be cute, 
I don't really care. I like being ugly. You understand what I'm saying? I've grown accustomed to it. I'm so ugly, I'm cute now. Mm. You understand what I'm saying? That's how I feel. I'm not here to impress you. I'm not here to impress anyone else because at the end of the day, we have, we have, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility. And our responsibility is to our ancestors. Because the fact that each and every one of us can come here and celebrate and commemorate here today was because of the bloodshed of our ancestors. Is that right? That's right. So our advancement, it's not about who you take a picture with. It's not about how many grants you can get. It's not about who like who. We're clear about the difference between a comrade and a friend. I prefer a comrade over a friend. Because when you're just friends, you get in your feelings. You get in your egos. At Black Power Media, I'm going to keep it funky. I don't like most of the people I work with. Tell the truth. Trying to tell you. Don't care. Hope you're watching. You already know. Who cares? The reality is, I have a mission. And when you're dealing, when you're on a mission, that mission has to be taken care of despite how anyone feels. We don't have time for, there's nothing personal when it comes to our people. You understand what I'm saying? I don't care about all that other nonsense. The reality is either we're going to win or like the hip hop group little brother said, we're going to look good losing. I'm going to pass the mic because I got a whole lot to say, but I'm letting my sister get down. All right, all valid points, brother. So I have a question for the audience. Um, where does social media come from? Can, can somebody answer me that question? Where does social media come from? Because I've been on social media since the days of MySpace. And everything was all good. And you could get the little glitter backdrops and, you know, all the, the butterflies and the starbursts. And, you know, I'll share my, my recording with you. You know, you hear some of my poetry. I click like on your picture. And there were simpler times back then. And then you had this Facebook to come along. And then from Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram and all of the other ones. But just to the point, what I've observed since we got off of MySpace is the system of records around social media. And for those of you who like to argue and box and talk about what you're going to do to your baby daddy, and talk about what this person said and what that person did and this politician and these folks over here. You are creating formal records. Not records for me to read, but records that can stand up in a court of law. And when you're talking about liberation movements, the first thing you should be thinking about is liberating yourself and your community, liberating your family. And so, I want to speak to the notion of just being strategic, being wise in social media. Because there's a lot that happens that could end up coming back to haunt us in a way that none of us want, right? And the other thing that we need to look at, you know, just as Sister Todd was sharing, the works that aren't being recorded, that aren't being documented, so to speak, are more than likely going to be the most critical work that we don't need to have a record of. When June 2020 happened, and I saw all of our people in the streets, I said, here we go. I knew that, that it was a curated movement. And it wasn't any of us who curated it. It was others that wanted to place additional targets upon us. I know what it is to walk with these brothers and sisters when there are no cameras on. Mm. And I tell you, it's a much freer walk than when they're watching us. So just keep that in mind. Um. Yeah, yeah.
Okay, thank you. So, um, thank y'all for, for sharing that. Um, and just, to, I mean, I guess, like, also to add to that, or just to, like, segue from that point, um, I, I met a lot of y'all along the way. Um, I mean, I think I'm, Taj, I think we first ran into each other, maybe on MySpace, something like that. But it was also important that we had lives outside of social media, you know what I'm saying? And it was like, like you said earlier, there was work that was being done that couldn't, that wasn't documented, and we already had relationships. Um, and a lot of those relationships were, uh, or are, intergenerational, right? One of the things that I notice when I see younger people jump off the porch to be in quote unquote activist circles is that uh, I don't I don't they don't be having OGs. They don't be having older people that they are in relationship with, you know what I'm saying? That not necessarily train them or mentor them, but that like I'd be like, like who who's your people? Like where you come from? Like what like not like necessarily like where you from but like, who are you connected to? You know what I'm saying? So, um, and, 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 I, and I know my personal reasons for doing that is, is, is also like to ground, like, okay, well, I kind of like, I can understand where this person is coming from ideologically because they are connected to Daruba bin Wahad, right? So I know if Daruba bin Wahad is, 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 is Gucci with you and know you and you've been working and you've been working with him, that you have a, a relationship that's rooted on that's rooted in principles that I'm in alignment with, and also like that he's trusted. So for 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 you all, can you all like talk a little bit about what intergenerational relationships mean to you in the movement? Like, what does it mean for you to have OGs? Like, I, I mean, you know, some people don't might not know what an OG is. To me, like, there's a difference between somebody being older and being an elder, right? Because there are people that are older that I think are, they do buffoon, they, excuse my language, they do buffoon things. You know what I'm saying? They are silly. You know what I'm saying? But there are elders that move wisely through the world and have lessons to teach and have you know, show they they put me underneath their wing and they've talked to me and said, "Yo, young blood, I see what you're doing. Let me help you. Let me have a conversation with you. Let me put you onto game." You know what I'm saying? Like, so there's a difference between somebody just being older. You know, be like, you know, be respectful, man. I'm old. That person. All right, yo, yo, I grew up on the block, man. There was crackheads on the block that was older than me. You know what I'm saying? Like there was junkies getting high. They were older than me, and like there was people trapping out of this older than me person's house. So you know what I'm saying? It's not no disrespect. Like I, just because you might have a drug addiction doesn't mean that I don't respect you. It's just like I know that you don't make the same decisions that I would make. You know what I'm saying? So what what does intergener intergenerational relationships mean to you in context of movement work? Well, I know for us uh, in the FTP movement. Um, OGs are very important, right? Brother Kalanji has this saying, it's the difference between an elder and an older. An older is a person that's just older than you, that has nothing to contribute to the situation. Uh, an elder is a person that's not only older than you per se, but also is uh, may have been doing something a little bit longer than you, you know? And um, we have respect for that as well. There, To me, there is nothing more euro-minded than thinking that you can just start and do things without any governance or guidance and when i say governance i don't mean like you know from the constitution you know nothing like that i mean from an organizational standpoint i know when i was in in grad school at uh georgia state um I went back, in preparation for this panel, I went back and went through some of my old research papers before we were doing stuff on the computer that was an actual paper. So I had to do this project and um, I did a lot of research on what are some of the components of community organizing and one of those things 
uh, was committed leadership and good governance. And what that means is, um, you know, in, in line with our African tradition, sitting at the feet of elders, asking questions and taking notes. And um, you have to have discernment, you know, in terms of who you want to get that education from. It's a lot of, um, you know, former uh, community activists that are out there. And some of them don't align with some of our principles, and that's cool, you know, no disrespect, but it doesn't align with what, what we're doing. So, you know, we align ourselves with those who uh, share the vision and the commitment. And um, it goes above, you know, because cause our, our, our OGs, right, in organizing, sometimes they get a little fanfare as well. Oh, that's so-and-so and so, you know. Oh, let me get a pic. And then, you know, some the, the thing about social media and stuff like that and taking pictures is very ego inflating. And um, in order to do this work, you have to have some destruction of the ego because like we were talking about earlier, comrades versus friends, a comrade's gonna be like, yo, you on some bullshit. That is dumb, don't do that. You look stupid, you look like a doofus. That ain't a good look. And you, you gotta know that if that's coming from your comrade, you know, they have a invested interest in you doing well. And it's not just a good look for the organization, it's a good look for you, it's a good look for me, it's a good look for us all. And we all benefit from it, but if you, uh, on the flip side or outside doing something dumb, it looks dumb on all of us and it brings a negative light on us all. So having, you know, governance with the elders, having leadership and guidance is very important in this work. You have to select someone who is um, in alignment with what it is that you're trying to do. And again, it doesn't matter if they're older, you know, like if I, if I wanted to develop a skincare product. Honeysuckle Moon is not that much older than me, but she has been doing skincare work longer than I have, even if I started right now. So if I wanted to develop a product, I would go to her and be like, yo, I got some questions. Can I take some notes? Can I pick your brain? Can I put something in your cash app for this sit down session? And then she would probably, you know, like, like, like she always, you know what, you give me nothing, you know, you know what I'm saying? But, you know, you want to take care of your, your elders. You want to take care of those who teach you and, you know, who impart game on you. And then we would sit down and she would tell me, you know, what I need to know. Because she's an elder. You know what I'm saying? So you have to select, again, people who are knowledgeable in what it is that you're trying to do. Some of these things that you're interested in doing, we'll talk about a little bit later. Some of these things that you're interested in doing, um, there's already been... Uh, brickwork laid. You know, somebody's already been doing that. You know, somebody wanted to come into Richmond and do a, a community farm. You got hella sites. That's like coming here and trying to start that and not sitting down with the Ron Chavis. Like, what we doing? You know what I'm saying? So, researching and, and making sure you know people who are already, because why reinvent the wheel when the wheel is already invented? It may already be on the road. You know what I'm saying? You could do more together than you can separate in what I've seen in today's work is it's more about the me look at me look at what i'm doing i'm doing this you know what i'm saying but if it if it wasn't for uh mama Inti who started independent birth work in atlanta you know what i'm saying mama saran you know nana tutu you know people like that there wouldn't be a real hole that would be able to exist without that foundational work already being put in. Or if it if it hadn't started with them, it would have been a lot harder for me to do. You know? So again, I, I wanna stress this. You gotta do your due diligence. You gotta do your homework before you get started in anything, because it's probably somebody that's already doing it. And have enough humility about yourself, because again, this is African people's work, right? So it's, it's very Euro-minded, very colonist-minded to think that you can just do something without talking to nobody. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's a colonist mindset. And if we're talking about liberation, we got to get off that. We got to be on something totally different. All right, all right. Um, uh, first off, when we say OG, we, we mean original gorilla, right? Means brothers and sisters, comrades with. Um, I don't know, realistically, 
I could not imagine sitting on this panel in front of you all having the audacity to open my mouth if I didn't sit at the feet of veterans and elders, right? I, call me what you want to. Say what you want to, think about what you want to, feel what you want to. I would not, I'm not brave enough, I'm not bold enough to sit in front of you, the descendants of a people who have been downtrodden, of a people who have been all but broken, raped, pillaged, murdered, and damn near annihilated. I don't have that type of courage to, by chance, have to face my ancestors and have to explain why I got up and wasted my people's time. I'm not that bold. And I consider myself a bad mother effort, but I'm not that brave because I would be guilty of ancestral treason, right? Because I'll be talking about something that I don't have no business talking about and I'll be faking the funk, as they say, right? I could not imagine. I'm so grateful because, again, I told you the region that I come from and I'm grateful because I was able to learn from the best of both worlds. I learned about, quote unquote, uh, our culture from people like the Dr. Clarks and the Dr. Benz, um, from Marimba Ani, who was formerly Donna Richardson, um, and so many others, the Dr. Jeffries, the Dr. Smalls, and all those folks on that end of the stick, the Wade Nobles, etc. But I also learned from the revolutionary community. My elders and ancestors from the Black Liberation Army to the Revolutionary Action Movement to the Black Guerrilla Family to the Students for Nonviolent uh, Students for Nonviolent Coordinating Committee to the Black Panther Party and so many others. I've been blessed to be accepted by my elders on all coasts of this particular colony of the United States. So I didn't just start commemorating Black August because I saw it on social media and I thought it was cool and I thought it was a, a new Black History Month. I learned from folks like OG Shaka Athenan, who's an ancestor right now. I learned from folks like OG Kamasi, who are founders of the Black August Organizing Committee. I didn't go read about the Black Liberation Army, I learned from folks like the Ruben Ben Wahad and the Sekou's and so many others, right? Now I want you to understand that I'm not name dropping because most of you never heard of the names that I'm dropping. I learned from some other people whose names you do know, but they get enough credit. And some of them get credit that they don't even deserve. That's neither here nor there. My point in saying this is a matter of principle. My duty and my job and my goal is to always uphold those who came before me. Because I believe that we stand on our ancestors' shoulders for real. It's not a slick sound bite. It's not, y'all think I'm cool because I can rap. It ain't none of that. There's nothing I'm saying to you today that is original. Let me start with that. I take no credit for anything that I'm saying except for where I grew up and how I learned. Right? but I learned from the people. And I learned from my OGs and I learned from my elders. When I talk about the difference between a comrade and a friend, we must be absolutely clear. Some of these folks don't know what it means to be a comrade because they have ulterior motives. A lot of the organizations and the organizers you hear today, many of them are part of the nonprofit industrial complex. Now, is that a diss on the nonprofit world? No. It is a diss on these suckers who utilize our people, who capitalize off the pain and bloodshed of our ancestors, who capitalize off of 
the uh, enslavement, the modern enslavement of brothers and sisters in our communities and give them no credit. A lot of these folks, they hold town hall meetings and they talk about gang violence and they talk about what's on the community violence and hood violence and all that, but they never invite anyone from the hood. Mm. And it don't take place in the hood, it's on some town hall where they feel safe. These are people you should run from, right? You have folks, and I'm gonna get a little ugly right now, but you have folks like Black Lives Matter who take our pain and our suffering and says white folks and other Negroes who don't have a real connection, or no, don't have a finger on the post of what's going on, they utilize them, they pimp them, and they profit off of them, and legitimate organizations and organizers continue to suffer. Some of y'all don't like that? I love it. Some of you may be a part of these organizations. To you, I say they are sincere ranks within all organizations. I'm not blaming the adherents. I'm blaming those who put this type of lifestyle in practice and who cause us more damage and more harm than not. I need y'all to understand something, right? Because I've spoken on many stages, held many mics, all that. I don't care if I never get invited to anything else in my life. I really don't. I really don't. I have nothing to prove. In the words of Harriet, we have nothing to lose but our chains, right? We are shackled, we are enslaved, we are suffering right now, all of us. Just because you have a six-figure job or salary, it don't mean shit at the end of the day because as a whole, we are still suffering, right? You cannot run from this. I don't care what you identify as. I don't care what you call yourself. If you are oppressed, if you are African in America, you are oppressed. It doesn't mean that you are a victim. Because if you become a revolutionary, you'll be clear that a revolutionary is never a victim. A revolutionary is clear what the cause and what the purpose is. You understand? I love us. Whether you love me or not, that's your red wagon. I have a responsibility. And that responsibility is a painful responsibility because it's lonely in these streets. When you stand up and you decide that you're going to speak, that you're going to exist, some people say you bold, some people say you brave, that don't mean anything. It means that you are defying our enslavement. It means that you are against oppression. It means that you'd rather die on your feet than to live on your knees. And some of you got knee pads on, you become comfortable and your knees have calluses on. But these knees ain't meant for that. Anyway, I'm sorry, I'm, I digress, pass this mic to you. I'm so thankful that I get to hold space with you and just continue to watch you grow into the elder that many of us need. We, we really need your strength, we need your fire. All right, so I was born on the same land that Huey P. Newton was born on. Monroe, Louisiana, Northern Bayou. My mama was born on the same land that Huey P. was born on and my daughter, even though she was conceived in another state, I went home and had that baby on that same land because I know that the reality that I personally endured in the rural south was nothing pretty. And we didn't have organizations to look to. That's why Huey left because the oppression was so deep at home he had to go elsewhere and find others because unfortunately, when you look to many rural areas of the South in particular, there's not enough of us who think about liberation, who know what Africa is. So when I found myself in Dallas, Texas, this was the mid 90s, and I was hosting some poetry readings and art shows. The consciousness was developing, 
But I'm thankful to say that my OG chose me. All right? I didn't go looking for him. Evidently, there was something in me that he saw that he was willing to nurture. And let me just touch on something, because there are a lot of elders and babas and ones out there who will look at you for your physical characteristics and decide that they have an alternate agenda. But this OG of mine, Bandeli Tahimba, rest in Pan-Africa, that brother came to me and he said, hey, little African. And I was uncomfortable the first time I got called to Africa. Let me be clear on that. All right? Because, see, that's something that many of us are not willing to admit. You know, there are levels to it, but as a barely 20-year-old person to be called an African by someone as powerful as Brother Bandeli was an opportunity for me to step into my next self. And so he said, why don't you uh, come over to my bookstore? I have a Pan-African bookstore over on Beckley Avenue, and I think that the work that you're doing would be best suited over there. And so I left the little bougie art gallery, and I went over to the Pan-African Connection. But see, there was a catch to it. Yes, I would have my poetry readings, but the poetry readings would always end in political education classes. And I'm telling you, there would be some people that would be sitting around the table. It's 12. <sighs> it's 1 o'clock. Okay. All right. When is he going to stop talking about this? But he took that as an opportunity to plant seeds in curious minds. And so me doing the work there as a poetry event coordinator then turned into say African um I gotta go and you know I got this meeting um do you think you could hold the store down for me for a little bit so now he's jumping me in the game of African store operations all right so now I'm learning about African bees, cowrie shells, all of the books, all of the early stationery, um, the, the clothing, everything that you could imagine in the form of statues and masks from all around Africa. I had to sign up for that. So he taught me how to run the, the cash register. And now, now let me just put it out there. By this time, I was already refusing the ideology around corporate America. So he's showing me a whole different way of process. And so when you're talking about OGs, is someone seeing a light in you and being willing to add their light to it because there were many powerful people who walked through those doors who are now ancestors that I had the pleasure of being in the same space with. And so by the time Early 2005 came around, he then said to me, hey, um, I got this shea butter right here, and I got this raw black soap over here. Why don't you take it home and see what you could do with it? So I went back to my mama's kitchen in Louisiana, and I started working the recipes, and you know, next to never, was the recipe wrong? Was there a problem with it? And so, 18 years later, I can say that because of that brother, I have yet to have a job, like, since. Like, I just, I haven't had a job. My only work has been working to make certain that the people are good through the vein of Honeysuckle Moon. And that is a tactic of black liberation. I'm one person. There's no telling who else he did that for, but I can speak to how that positively affected my life. And so now we're nearly 20 years into this thing, and he's now gone on with the ancestors, but me and his wife will be connecting for a conversation next month. And so what that lets me know is while they were raising their youths, 
she sees me as one of those who was also valuable enough to be cultivated by her king. And now she sees that the work is beneficial enough to where she can sit with me, I can sit with her, we can sit with the people, and we continue to build upon that. And so I just encourage you, if you have children, if you have young ones who, you know, you feel like need to be placed on a certain path, Find a righteous elder. Don't find an older. Because there's a lot of old fools out there who I run far away from. Don't come near me if you think you got some game, if you think I'm hot. Don't come near me. I, I deal from the heart chakra up. So when you look for individuals who move in that spiritual vein, let them do martial arts with your babies. Let them do arts with your youth. Inspire them because you have no idea how that seed may end up changing the trajectory of your family and everything that we stand for as a people. Yes. Yo, this is crazy because literally when you said that yeah, your elders chose you, I I affirm that that happened with me. I mean, I was I was I was 19 years old and I would go volunteer at the Black History Museum and Culture Center of Virginia. And, you know, I love that shit so much, I just kept going. You feel me? I just, I was like, y'all, I'm just going to be here. This is what I'm doing. You know what I'm saying? And the elders that were there, they wrapped their arms around me. You feel me? And they was like, yo, boom, boom, boom. And I remember the first time we did Happily Naturally, the very first one in the back parking lot at 00, Zero Clay Street, after I did that shit, um... Queen and Zinga, uh, Janet Fleming Brown. I don't even, I don't see her here. But she called me after and was like, yo, young blood, I, that was, that was, that was nice. You should join this organization. And the organization was the Universal Negro Improvement Association, the African Communities League, founded by the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey. And in my 19 year old, 20 year old mind, like I, at the 20, I was 22 at the time, and I was like, I didn't even know this organization existed anymore. I mean, I got philosophy and opinions of Marcus Garvey sitting on my shelf. I'm, I read this stuff. I'm thinking this is something the far gone past. And then I walk into the room, and there's like five, six black brothers and sisters, and they're like, yo, we representing this red, black, and green. And so that was so formative for my young self, right? You know what I'm saying? When you're in your early 20s, 21, 22, you still trying to figure out, okay, what am I going to do with my life? Or what am I doing? Period. And so for these elders, for, that, for, that, for those elders at the Black History Museum and then Janet to like hold me, you know what I'm saying? And not, not, not try to, you know what I'm saying? Like just try to help, like I want to help you, brother. I see what you doing. I want to help you. But one thing that was, was critical is that I had to get me right. You know what I'm saying? I had to, I had to, um, I had to be confident, you know what I'm saying? And clear, like, yo, this is what the fuck I'm doing. Like, you know, okay, like, I don't know where it's gonna go. I didn't have, I didn't have no business plan and then I shit, you know what I'm saying? Like, this is like, yo, I, I love my people, I love the movement, but I had to get my insides right. And so, um, what, for, for you, for you all on the, on, on the stage, you know what I mean, what is, or how does the self, how does self-development intersect with your maturation and development in community? Like, I mean, and, and I, that might sound really lofty, but I'm gonna just like, let me cut to the core. Like, we all human beings. We in this shit, we making mistakes. You know, we try to live lives, raise families, babies, children, you know what I'm saying? Be in relationship and love, you know, and in interpersonal space with other human beings, black and brown folks in the movement. What importance or how has the work of self-development and you refining yourself and your own character and your own persona, your personhood, how has that, what has that been like for you coming up in the movement yeah. What has that been for like you? What, what has that been like for you? So, 
you know, a lot of us are under the impression and were raised with the ideal that once you turn 18, you've grown, you gotta get out and get your own spot and figure life out, right? So a lot of, some of us were out of the house before we were 18, um, you know, and that's no shade to my mother. My mother's a beautiful woman. Um, but at 18, I had it in my mind, okay, I'm 18, it's time for me to go. So I went and, you know, went on to school or whatever, started having children early and, um, I always knew that I, I wanted to um, save lives, but I didn't I didn't know what that meant, right? So, you know, within the vein of organizing, I um, learned what I love to do, and um, it it happened one time I was um, out feeding the people, and um, someone collapsed, right? And um, I went into saving lives more. And it wasn't the first time, and this is not me bigging up myself, this is me trying to tell you where I come from. So, um, you know, I went on to um, improve that situation, you know, got, got the people there to, to help them. And I remember I wrote um, uh, Baba Matulu about it. And um, he reminded me that one time I said to him that I wanted to be a firefighter, right? And I said, I did say that, and he was like, you should do that. So I, um, you know, I reluctantly thought about it. Ah, oh, that's working for the system, man. No, 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 no. But what I came to later understand is that um, they didn't expect a person like me to even get that far through the process, and um, they made it hell for me. And it was through that process I learned my own strength because I was not only verbally abused, I was physically abused. I had my ass kicked a lot. And um, it was then I learned like, damn, I must really want to do this because real life me would have been choked these folks out. I would, I would have called somebody up here to blow these folk head off. Like, you know, old, old me, you know, had to take a back seat though, you know? And old me is what gave me the, the fortitude and the strength to endure what I knew was my purpose. So once you know what your purpose is, nothing can get in the way of that, right? So my purpose is saving lives, right? So I went on to finish the fire academy, go through everything that I went through, still continue to go through to this day and have made it to the rank that I have made it to. And with doing all that, I have continued to fulfill my life's purpose. So through this work, you can really find what your purpose is. When you say you want a community organizer, it's so grand, it's so big, it's so ambiguous. What does that really mean? And there are so many pieces of where we are disenfranchised shit. Where you want to start at, my boy? Like, we got a long list. You know, we can go from voter registration to food insecurity to... Uh, malpractice in the medical system to you know the lack of access for methadone clinics for those who don't have insurance where you want to start you know so you have to you have to decide what your passion is and then figure out what your purpose is and really that doesn't come until you mature you know what i'm saying like um moon just told y'all like she was in her 20s and she still wasn't sure yet you know what i'm saying when her og picked her she still wasn't quite sure yet uh, the version of Brother Kalanji that I met back in 06 is not the version that sits in front of you today. And neither am I. You know what I'm saying? So, decide what your purpose is and identify those in the community who, you know, kind of align with what it is that you're trying to And as long as you follow your purpose you don't get lost you don't get bored you don't you don't lose interest and you never retire from this moment there are just different ways you impact right so in my life as a fire what you know i do a lot of things in my life as a firefighter i i love that part of my life because i get to be in a community in the city that i was raised in and save lives and people look at me like wow you the person here to save my life you look like me yeah i look like you because i am you i didn't see that when i was a kid you know so once i discovered what my purpose was it was easy to follow my path so not only is this work uh beneficial to the community it's beneficial to you for growth 
you really get to learn what your strengths are and where your passion lies. And as long as you chase your passion, you know where you're going. There's a bunnies child sitting over there to the left, right? When I met her, she was not a chef. She's a community organizer. We all were when, when we met back in the early 2000s. You know, we, Deron will tell you, we were some wild folks back then. We just knew that we were interested in the liberation of our people. And we all have figured out what our passion is and where we started is not where we are. It's like a branch, it's like a tree, you know what I'm saying? And while we all are doing the community work, it's all focused in different areas. Decide what your passion is and as long as you chase your passion and your purpose, you're going in the right direction. Yeah, um, I think um, my, 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 my Christian family would say that Jesus spoke the language of the people, right? You have to speak the language of the people, right? And that's what Taj was just talking about. I think that um, we, we, we live in an era where everything is about the ego. It's all about, you know, and that's why, like the brother mentioned earlier, social media is such an important drug when it comes to, um, I say that social media is like a, uh, like a steroid to your mind muscle, right? It gets it all puffed up, and just like steroids do, it's not good for your body. So it's not good for your mind to have you walking around uh, thinking that you're something you're not, right? Um, I say the social media is a do-it-yourself fed file because you know you tell the people everywhere you at what you're doing, what you like to eat, who you like to eat with, whatever. This thing is about growth, it's about us being humble as African people, right? When it comes to our organization. When it comes to the work we do, and that includes Black Power Media, everything is about the liberation of our people, right? A few years ago, I started the podcast thing was, was, was about to go, go up, right? So I reached out to a brother I was organizing with at the time, um, and we started a... Um, a program called Renegade Coaching. Then after maybe three years, my mind, I'm always thinking of how can we move collectively, right? So even with FTP movement, we evolved to the Siafu movement and we have like nine different organizations under that particular umbrella, right? We have the African Martial Arts Institute, Free Mom Academy, Siafu Youth Corps, um, Urban Survival Preparedness Institute, and I'm not going to remember everybody and everything right now, but I'm just giving you an idea. So from the podcast piece, for me, I never wanted to sit in front of a screen and talk to myself, because that's what it feels like, right? So I said that I wanted to grow that thing. So we partnered with our other partner, Jared Ball, I reached out to him, I said, listen, we should start a podcast network and get different folks on it with different views, so on and so forth, all dealing with African liberation, right? All dealing with black people. We don't always have to be on the same page, but we gotta be on the same book. And for the last two and a half years, we've been doing that. My sister Jackie, she has a show, Luke Mar Nation, on the platform. Uh, she's also on the Remix Morning Show. And, and, and so many other folks that you may know of, so on and so forth. We came together collectively to build something. Now, we all might look at it differently. For me, it's propaganda. Make no mistake about it. That's why I'm doing it. I'm not there. I don't care if you like me or not. You watch the show, it's great. We'll bring on some dope guests and all that. But that's irrelevant. I'm in this thing. I'm selfish. This is about our movement. It's about our people's liberation. I'm not trying to come up. I'm not trying to get some invites to somebody's speaking engagement. I don't care. The reality is, 
we have to think collectively. Our individualistic mindset set. As my sister talked about earlier, it is a European, European mindset. It is amazing, but we're trying to outdo each other. It's amazing to me that we all consider ourselves African, or black, or indigenous, or original, whatever you want to call yourself. Like they said on uh, American Gangster, you call it uh, blue dog shit if you want to, just don't call it blue magic. Whatever you want to call yourself, however you want to label yourself, at the same time, we all in the same ship. We all traveled across that slave ship, and we all being oppressed, so on and so forth, so we have to figure out how do we survive America, how do we survive imperialism. On purpose, I use the Lauren Hill theory, I had a mother after so the ignorant is here, right? On purpose, I speak broken English, right? I'm proud of that. I'm proud of that. I've spoken it Damn every Ivy League college, university, out this mug, to the HBCU, so on and so forth, and I'm still me. I don't change my pitch or scratch when I don't itch because some white folks come around. If they're not clear about my agenda, they will learn. And if they don't like it, it don't matter. If I'm on CNN or RBN, it's the same movement. We are afraid to be ourselves. The beautiful thing about the people that you see on this platform today, and many of you out here, is that we had the audacity to be ourselves. How the song go? I want to thank you for letting me be myself. Y'all feel me on that? I know I can't sing, but don't try to play me like I ain't dope. Anyway, we have to be humble. We have to be respectful. We're on this planet for a very short, very limited time. Less than 100 years in most cases. We can't stress ourselves out. We can't stress each other out. We can't be trying to diss each other. We have to come together collectively because in my mind, in my spirit, and in my soul, at 52 years old, I say we're gonna win in spite of ourselves. We will be victorious. I refuse to believe or accept that we're gonna lose. I refuse to believe or accept that we were brought here to become chattel slaves and to build white people shit up. I refuse to believe that we have to bow down and be Negroes and that we have to chase some dead white folks, somebody else's ancestors in order for us to be relevant. We will win. And I'm going to pass the mic because I almost lost my train of thought because I was about to start talking about something else. But we love y'all. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> All right. So um, I just got to do a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, Chef Raven, I just ordered like another one of those really, really good mango lemonades and I paid via Cash App. So if someone who loves me could bring me a nice icy mango lemonade from Chef Raven, that would be amazing. All right, so here's my, my question to the people. How many of y'all feel like you're, you're living in your purpose just by a raise of the black fist? Who feels like they're living in their purpose? Oh my, wait a minute. Hold up. I'm scared. All right, it's just, I, I saw out of everybody out there, because y'all weren't looking around, I saw what, what maybe 10, 15% of the people out there? Yeah, so so I've got major concerns. So so let me try this another way. Um, can a few of y'all just kind of shout out what it is that you currently do um, for a living, for your community? Like, I just need to hear some calls to action. So like, uh, what, what do you do, sister? I'm an organizer, radio show host, political education. All right. Is you sell good weed? No, I'm joking. Oh, nice. Roll them up. All right. So, all right. What about my brother, uh, Bigger Than Hip Hop? All right. What do you do, brother? All right. Educator. All right. So, organizer, ganja lady, educator. All right. What about you, my brother, who's smiling? We talked about the dreadlocks. Well, what you do? Father, producer. All right. Okay. I love that. Producer. All right. My father and producer, yeah, father first. 
Okay, mom for Maroon. Well, what do you do, my sister? All right, I was an area that they wanted nobody to think was real. They wanted us to think that it was blowed up and that it was non-existent. But what if we, as African people, are finally granted District 13? Will we have all of the tools that is required? Do y'all feel ready to, to go live a, a sovereign liberty? Does anybody feel ready? Or, or do, do we feel like, thank you, or, thank you. Do we feel like there needs to be more work done? All right, so, so if you say that it's more work to be done, this is my challenge to you. Because see, I had to do a lot to be right here. Brother Bandeli and the All African People's Revolutionary Party was just one stage of it. See, that secured my fire and that helped me to come into my African identity. But guess what? I had to go and learn some things Sometimes I had to go and work beside people who I didn't even want to work with just to be given the necessary knowledge that I could go build upon over the course of time. But I challenge each of you who don't have a particular contribution to the liberation of our people, if you haven't figured out what it is yet, just pick an industry. I didn't see nobody raise their hands. I think there's only one brother that I've met along the journey here who actually manufactures toilet paper. But it's too many black asses <laughs> Nobody to make no for one person to be making toilet paper. All right? And so, so with that stated, I really want to encourage each of you to find something that could rightfully contribute to the emancipation of our people. Because one of the most fascinating and humbling revelations that I had is there's no way that I could do all of this by myself. And that it's absolutely going to take all of us. I need my sister Taj's skills. I need them. You need them. If anything pops off right now, I promise you, this is the most valuable sister out here. All right? I need this brother right here. Something pops off, I know that he's one of the ones that's going to have us covered up here. So I encourage each of you to find that space within your divine purpose. Like, don't let life get too far. Don't let your bills get too big to where you always talk yourself out of doing what your ancestors are whispering for you to do. Just go do it. And you know, it don't take $10,000 to start a black-owned business. The average black-owned business can get started with less than $500. And y'all spend that every month. So please go and find that purpose so that way we can be a stronger, more emancipated people, all right? So, yeah, so um, I want to thank my guests today, um, Kalanji, uh, Jamachanga, uh, Dr. Taj, and Wabal, and Honeysuckle Moon for joining us on this panel, organizing this No Cool. Um, can I give y'all an opportunity to, to, to uh, just, because um, we got to do sound check, you know, get ready, um, you know how it go, CPT, black people. I told somebody today, I said, um, time is an illusion. I live in a multi-dimensional universe where time is relative. <laughs> Yo, so but we got to get ready to move on. But go ahead. I'm, I'm, yeah, if anybody got any last words. Oh, last words and contact how people can get in connection with you um, and support the work that you do. Let's go. All right. Um, first of all, thank y'all. Thank y'all for checking us out, for listening to us. You know, that was parts of time in your life that you can't get back. So I appreciate you sharing it with us. Um, real quick, a couple things. This right here is a zine that uh, one of my uh, comrades, Dr. Joy James and I put out. Um, if you come see me on this tent right here, I got one for you. It's free. It's not going to cost you anything. How about that? It's about 52 pages dealing with Cop City, um, dealing with uh, how we're dealing with an urban enclave. 
Also, Organizing is a New Cool is a film. It's a documentary we'll be releasing officially. Next year will be our 20 year anniversary of the FTP movement. I have a few of these t-shirts. Now I love to give all y'all each one of them. Before donation, we'll hit y'all. We'll be under this thing over here. We thank you all and love you, appreciate you. Oh, um, on social media, uh, Twitter, that's that. At Kalanji Changa. On um, IG, I think it's at who he talking to, who he talking to, for obvious reasons. And uh, the website for our film is the is uh, organizing is the new cool dot com. Organizing is the new cool dot com. Also check out our website. Um, and if you don't follow Black Power Media on YouTube, blackpowermedia.org is our platform. And uh, again, thank you all. Go follow that brother right now. Like, go on IG, go on Twitter, follow him right now. So, of course, um, you can find me up in the sky, you know. Check for me when the moon is full, when the moon is, you know, at a quarter, uh, the new moon, you know, like, like we're we just going to dismantle social media for a minute. Just, just get up there with me. Uh, but if you would like to connect with me through social media, Instagram is how you can find me, um, at Honeysuckle Moon. I also have an art install of the Roots, Trees, and Flowers Urban Wellness Lounge over here at Happily Natural 20th Anniversary, just over here in the wellness area. You'll see the Roots, Trees, and Flowers Urban Wellness Lounge, and you can come for the best aromatherapy and organic plant-based facial care products and um, just come check out our stress reductive beauty bar and you can even come meditate um, we can smudge you we can do all kinds of good works and so if you feel like you just need a few moments to sit with yourself to sit with some people um, who want to reflect your light and be good to you please come and see us over there and uh, next month I have the fifth annual Vibrant Moons Natural Wellness Festival for the Indigenous Woman in Atlanta, Georgia. And we will have quite a few people coming through to share their wisdom. And um, I like to work with women because if you can get a woman to trust you, then she'll trust you with her children. She'll trust you with her mother and father. She will trust you with her husbands. And so creating those safe spaces and building... Um, a woman's consciousness to the degree to where she's more fortified and open is um, one of my personal superpowers and I look forward to just connecting with you all on all levels including getting in some good hugs once we get off the stage. Peace and love. Um, in closing, I just want to thank you Brother Manifest. Thank you, Duran, my brother. You've been rocking with the FTP movement for a long time, specifically Kalanji and myself, and we salute you. We appreciate the work that you are doing up here in Richmond. We appreciate all of the sacrifices that you have put into this community. We appreciate you sacrificing your personal time and resources, because I've seen you come out your own pocket in the early stages of this thing, which is sometimes required of organization. And I want to take the time to recognize you for that. And I also want to salute your wife, because I know for a long time you were doing this work by yourself. And I want to salute Mrs. Chavis for coming on the scene and adding on to the work that you've been doing. I don't even recognize y'all children anymore, because they're all adults. We are now, we're all, we're all grandparents at this point, you know. I'm grandma too. So we've watched each other grow our families grow and us grow as people. And I just want to salute you for the work that you are doing. Every time I come up here, the work is bigger and better. And I need you to hear that, because sometimes we need to hear that, you know? We need to hear from people on the outside, not just people from your city. We all the way down in the A. And we see that work and it radiates all the way down the coast to where we at, from the 804 to the 404. Come on now, come on now. We see you, we love you, and we appreciate you. And I hope I hope they have as much honor and respect for you here as we do for you so down too. down bottom. We we really honor and, and love what you're doing here. So thank you for always including us every year without fail since 2006. We have been here. 
right. and I appreciate you and love you. And this what is you free. No, I'm just saying, this right here is free. This brother's bringing Dead Prez. Dead Prez will be rocking at seven something today. You can't go no free Dead Prez concert nowhere. At all. You know what I'm saying? We, we, I mean, yeah. Give this man another round of applause, man. So, um, in closing, I didn't really get to touch on this, but I just wanted to give y'all a few pointers of um, community organizing work. It is demand responsive, not supply driven. It is holistic, integrated, and process oriented. You got to have community management. You got to have technically feasible, indigenous, accessible, and affordable, committed leadership, and good governance. Synergy amongst partners. You know, you see me and Kalanji go back and forth with like brothers and sisters. You know, you gotta be you, you gotta be in tune with who you're doing the work with. And gender sensitive and respectful of where everybody is coming from. Everybody is not coming from, from the same theology, from the same background, from the same mindset. It's gonna take multiple versions of us. That means all identities, okay? That means all religious and spirituality thoughts. That means all However, people identify as themselves. If you are African in this country, you are oppressed. And it's time to come together and work together. And it's a few white folks out here. White folks, you have your place in the movement. Because guess who needs to educate other white folks? White folks! Because if it comes from us, it sounds like we're complaining. You know what I'm saying? So it's going to take y'all to educate y'all folks on what's going on. That's true allyship. Not just wearing the t-shirt, not just coming to the events, actually being an ally. And we got plenty of white folks that stand with us. We got plenty of LBGTQIA plus folks that, stay, that stand with us on the front lines. Sometimes they beat us there. Okay, so that, that's no shade to no different types of people. Everybody got a role. But if you are truly an ally, you're going to be on those front lines with us. And um, in closing, that, that's, that's what it is. That's, it's going, that is organizing. Right. Everybody coming together. All right? So um, you can find me on all social media at Beretta Sky King. Um, and the business, the, the birth house I was telling y'all about, and all of the, the recipes and the gardening lessons and stuff that I do, that's at Real Whole, R-E-A-L-W-H-O-L-E, and Beretta is like the gun, B-E-R-E-T-T-A, Scott King. And you can find me there. I am slow as hell to respond, so please give me grace. I have ADD. My mind is always moving. So, yeah, you can find me there. <laughs> Peace. Thank you so much. We appreciate Yo, it. Yeah, give it up for our panel. All right, so um, we're going to get this.